This is the Future Talent Podcast, a future-focused podcast series showing the channels that enterprise can engage today to empower their current employees and future-proof the talent pipeline of tomorrow. This series is brought to you by Technological University Dublin's Enterprise Academy. We create learning solutions to enable your business success. Want to find out how we can support your learning and development needs? Visit www.tudublin.ie forward slash enterprise dash academy to book in a call with our team. Hello and welcome to the Future Talent Podcast. This episode is all about authentic assessment, what they are, examples of them, and how learners can apply them in their career development. You will hear Alexander Osterwalder's business model canvas referred to in the discussion. For those of you listening not in the world of business and entrepreneurship, the business model canvas is essentially a visual template designed by Osterwalder in 2005 to help businesses describe, design and analyse their business models. By all accounts, a useful tool, as you will hear from Liam. After listening to the story of each panellist, Dr. Claire McBride observes how their experience with executive education allowed them to layer learning onto their current expertise to either climb the ladder or switch careers, crucially without taking a step backwards. And of course, this is the aim of executive education. So it is great to hear this confirmed in the stories from our TU Dublin graduates. start with Liam Cronin, uh, CEO of the RDI Hub and more recently CEO of Regional HBAN. Uh, so Liam, I'm just going to start by asking what brought you to TU Dublin in terms of its predecessor organisation, in terms of your learning needs and your, your growth aspirations. Yeah, no, thanks Claire, I'm delighted to be here today. So I suppose, yeah, my background was I, I joined Microsoft and kind of went on a journey uh, for about 25 years at Microsoft, and I, at once I come towards the end, I kind of realised I didn't need to change, and I needed to find a new direction. But I didn't know where I wanted to go. And um, the post, I think it was the first year of the postgraduate diploma, I saw it being advertised, and you know, I had a young family, four young kids, and I was like, kind of going to really, can I go back, can I commit to, to doing it? But it was, you know, it was a half day Friday, it was a full day Saturday, and, and what I liked about the course from the word go, just looking at syllabus, was the applied element of it. But I had massive trepidation because I was like, God, how am I going to go back 22 years since I've actually picked up a book, four kids at home, wife is not going to uh, row in behind me, the whole lot, all these trepidations. But I went in on the Friday and the first module that we were doing was on business model canvas. And at the time, as I was kind of coming to the end of Microsoft, I had gone contracting. I had a startup idea that I was working on uh, with Dr. Kate Coleman down BlackRock Clinic, which was about developing a cataract training simulator. And Kate had sold me on a massive vision, and she was incredibly inspirational. And I was meant to be in the business stuff to it. So the very first module was on Business Model Canvas. And I was like, I remember Ray Mel Pereira was doing the module. He put up the Business Model Canvas. And like what Dr. D was saying earlier on, it was very theoretical, and it was really, really strong. And then I was like, maybe let's stop doing the Business Model Canvas on my startup. And that's where the journey began for me, because it was just inspirational. You know, started building out the Business Model Canvas that day on the startup idea, realized all the gaps that we needed to address and then at the end of the module, Claire told us your assignments on that, so we spent the next month developing the business model canvas to bring it back. Um, but it was just that applied learning was, was just fantastic. Um, and then, you know, you talk about soft skills earlier on. I got all these doubts about how would I get on that first assessment? Would I get 40%? Would I pass? And then the result comes back and you kind of go, wow, I actually can do this. Like, you know, I haven't forgotten all the skills I had 20 years ago. So, so I think the applied element was great. And then... I suppose all throughout that postgraduate, there was 10 modules. I did it all on the, on the startup idea. And I suppose then just to kind of finish it off, we had to do our dissertation. And I was getting a bit dubious about, was there a gap in the market for the product? I could see there was a need. I could see we had a really nice prototype. So I did my dissertation on, basically, was there a market for the product we were developing? And to cut a long story short, from all the analysis we did, we found there was a gap in the market, but there wasn't a big enough gap. So... Like, it saved me a lot of money, saved me a lot of time, and we basically decided we weren't going to continue with that product. Um, but that learning was great for me, and, and now that we're, even I followed it through then to the RDI Hub where we support startups, and every time I meet a startup, the first thing I tell them to do is create a business model canvas, mm -hmm. and the second thing I tell them to do is go do their customer discovery and find out is there a gap in the market. So all that learning has become relevant to date and stuff like that as well. Uh, do you want me to talk okay, about the no, that's, well? that's no, that's great. We'll, we'll come back to that, Liam. 
Um, so just for context, uh, Liam was, uh, took the postgraduate diploma in product management, which kicked off in 2011, and he was part of the pioneer team that uh, tested it for us. <clears throat> and important, I suppose, in the context of both Liam and Siobhan, uh, is that both of their programs were partner programs. So product management in partnership with Digital Skillnet, and we'll come on to the postgraduate diploma in management and marketing in partnership with the Marketing Institute of Ireland. So very much, uh, I suppose, a posture and a muscle that is ready and really engaged in partnership. And we find that blend uh, an excellent one in terms of ensuring that we have academic rigor in the program, really important as an educational institution, but we also have relevance to practice. And maybe a, a little bit of uh, a link with someone in the audience here. So Damien Owens, uh, Director General of Engineers Ireland, sat on the validation panel initially for the postgraduate diploma in product management. It was the first in the world. I don't normally talk about world firsts or largest because if they're not delivering the outcomes that we desire, then first and largest have absolutely no value whatsoever. Uh, but Damien and I had, had worked together uh, quite a number of years ago uh, on, uh, I essentially was a, a, a product director based in Holland working on a call center platform that we distributed through then Aircom here. Uh, and Damien also got engaged in giving me 360 feedback. I don't know if you remember that, Damien, but I still have it. Um, <laughs> so just... You know, I suppose really a demonstration of that ecosystem linkage that I mentioned in the opening is that we're very open to that. And I think that that's what gives us that edge in terms of, of relevance and agility and innovation because we're, we're really driven by those ongoing conversations. So uh, that's the, the, I suppose the other thing to say about the postgraduate diploma is that the, the drive to develop a master's track on that particular program came from industry and the participants on the postgrad dip. So looking at that stackability, if we look at microcreds today, which are probably the new currency among the currency of skills, um, then we're very attuned to that need to respond to busy people with four kids at home or whatever it is that we have going on in our lives. We might be in the sandwich generation, et cetera. So how do we fit that learning platform, if you like, to the, to the needs of the lifelong learner? So moving to Siobhan who followed the path of the postgraduate diploma and uh, I think afterwards the master's in management and marketing. And just talking to us a little bit about uh, the interesting reason that took you on that journey, so. Sure, yeah. Um, so I reached a point, I suppose, in like my mid to late 20s where I was in a finance role and um, kind of staring down the path of maybe doing um, your financial accounting exams. Um, and if anyone knows me, they wouldn't correlate the two things, like my personality and, and that path. Um, I loved communication. I was really creative. I was the person in the office always organising the ad hoc after work things and, and social things. So um, I was kind of faced with a situation where my company was saying, you know, like, we'll support you if you want to do like your ACCA exams or anything like that. And I, I just had to take a really big step back and go, like, what do I want for my career and I knew, I knew it wasn't finance. Um, so I asked our CMO to have a conversation with me at the time I was in Green Corps. Um, and he said to me, you know, go back. And I was saying, maybe I'll go back to university and, and study marketing. Um, so I did my research. Uh, I ended up having a phone call with um, Dr. Leslie Murphy here and just explained to her, listen, you know, I have an undergrad in arts degree, a Bachelor of Arts degree from Maynooth. Um, but since then, I'd kind of gone to Australia and I landed a job in finance and it was all just kind of fell into place naturally. And um, this was the first time I was being proactive, I suppose, about taking control of my career. Um, so I signed up for the, the postgrad, as you mentioned. Um, I had a very uh, difficult challenge, I suppose, of the time, at the time of kind of getting the first business opportunity in marketing. Um, so what I decided to do was do as much voluntary work as I could. 
um, because everywhere you go, you know, you're in your mid to late 20s, you don't want to go back to a graduate salary. So you're trying to say, I've loads of transferable skills and I've loads of examples. So um, I started to, you know, spend my, my spare time that wasn't kind of in college is trying to get experience up. Um, and a lot of that was done through like nonprofits and charity work. So um, I finally landed a, a job. Um, it wasn't a graduate position, which was great because I couldn't have faced going back to, to square one. Um, just after I'd done the, the postgrad, um, and then less than a year later, I was um, I was called up by a company called SQS, um, and I was just about to kind of go into the master's course as well, and. Um, and then I took on the, the first role in marketing that they had. Um, so I suppose if I talk a little bit about what I, you know, applying, I suppose, what I learned in, in the, the course, the first role I got, I was the first marketing person in that organization. So it was a, a, phar a pharmaceutical company. Um, it was a cooperative and they needed someone in the head office. So I had to basically go in there um, with no prior experience in work and kind of set up their marketing function with them. Um, very little budget and just, you know, um, but I had the confidence to do that because of what I'd learned on the course, which I think is a really critical um, point, you know, that I, I actually felt comfortable to step in. In my interview, I did a full marketing strategy for them, you know, and they, they hired me off of that rather than kind of what I had um, experience in um, work-wise. And uh, same thing then when I went into SQS, which was a much larger, larger organization, um, I had to go in there and start from scratch. And at that point, they hadn't had a marketing person in the Irish business, so they uh, had the misconception, I always say, like the three Ps, that they think marketing is like pens, PowerPoints, and parties. Um, <laughs> <laughs> so I had to... Um, they, we talk about repositioning brands. I had to repositioning what, mar what marketing meant in that company. Um, so that was like my first task. Uh, and following that, then, we were acquired by a French engineering company. So there was a... Uh, rebrand coming up and I had then the opportunity to do my dissertation in my master's on rebranding which I did the dissertation on and then was able to actually um, carry out for the business which was just absolutely invaluable. And we'll come back to that. Mm. Thank you. So both Liam and Siobhan have mentioned that marriage if you like between the learning content on the program Lucia and the assessment for learning. So as we like to say uh, assessment drives learning in many regards. Can you just talk a little bit about designing that approach or that process? You mentioned it earlier in your examples, but approaching that design, and again, that careful balance or arriving at a careful balance between theoretical rigor and application to practice. Yeah, it's a challenging task, um, but we have been perfecting it for the last couple of years. Um, the students have to master the theoretical concepts and the frameworks, but then how we examine it, you know, we can be creative about it because we want to examine them in a way that they further learn new skills, like soft skills. So with authentic assessment, you know, the students are still, you know, keeping the, the rigor and the academic, you know, level of seven, eight, nine, or whatever it might be. But how they're applying that knowledge, you know, we, we do it through an authentic way. So, for example, um, we would have students, say, in international management undergraduate um, module, um, need, had to pick one issue that is relevant for managers based on what they learned in the module. So it could be any topic um, that relate to, to, related to international management. So for that, they need to go and explore it theoretically as well. Then they needed to distill the idea further and think about how they're going to create a video that they would share with practitioners with a language that would appeal to the practitioners and outline key learnings or call to action. So you can see that you know, it's very complex, but it is, the theory is being translated in a very creative way. And for a lot of those students, you know, interaction with, with LinkedIn was their very first experience at that point. They had to go and set up a profile. They were feeling very nervous about it. But afterwards, when they did share it and they got feedback and comments, some students got over 1,000 uh, likes and comments from industry, from managers, they were delighted with themselves. And it had a huge impact on their confidence, on their learning. And now I see them posting so confidently as, as they graduate. And so there was lots of learning there. Thank you. So I think we're going to touch on accredited learning and the, and the differential, if you like, between 
accredited education and other modes after lunch. Um, but really looking at, I suppose, what we would generally work with is module descriptors, and anyone who's ever been through a program will be familiar with that. And when I began my journey in education around 2005, I previously had a career in the telecoms sector, as I mentioned. The genius of a module descriptor was something that landed with me really early. Uh, because we state what the, what the outcomes are at, at the outset, and then at, with lots of other detail involved, uh, we state how we're going to measure that learning through assessment. So it's a very powerful circular system, if you like. And I suppose coming back to some of the comments that both Liam and Siobhan made. Liam, you talked about your, your master's thesis, and that was on <clears throat> strategic partnerships. And maybe just, you know, I suppose one of the things that can be leveled at us when we work with professionals is the risk of learning by templates. So Liam uh, referenced the business model canvas. The way that we integrate that into a full module is that you just, it's not just about understanding how to complete a canvas. It's understanding all of the work and the research that went into building that canvas, which as many of you know, was one of the most uh, profitable PhDs ever by Alex Osterwalder. Um, but really building in, I think, the, the, the critical fluency, if you like, that goes along with the academic frameworks and one's ability not just to share that in brown bags at lunchtime back at the ranch, but also to rationalize it and potentially to defend it. So I think that's a big distinction in how we craft accredited learning effectively. So just bringing you back to strategic partnerships and maybe any other highlights you have. And we spoke about lifelong learning this morning, life-wide learning, learning to learn. Um, just some highlights that you might draw forward from that. Yeah, so I, I guess, look, after finishing the postgraduate diploma, then, you know, the logical next step was to continue to do the master's because, you know, you're kind of on a journey and it, it made sense. And as Claire was saying, like, the master's was a lot more theoretical and stuff like that, uh, but there was a dissertation at the end. And I think one of the modules or one part of the module, strategic partnerships, came up. And I'll be honest with you, I hadn't really delved into strategic partnerships that much in my time at Microsoft. And I was like, that seems really, really interesting. So I ended up doing the dissertation on strategic partnerships um, but it's, I still follow it through right through today because I think doing that, uh, that just opened my mind a lot more to opportunities outside Microsoft. And I ended up getting a role then when I left Microsoft and Trinity College Dublin, working as a commercialization director in one of the, one of the research centers. And it was all about developing strategic partnerships in terms of commercializing the research and getting it out there. Um, and then after I left that role three years ago and took on the CEO role in, in Kerry, like straight away, strategic partnerships came to my mind. I remember saying it in the interview, to the interview panel from FEXCO that, you know, we're not going to build an RDI hub, a world-class innovation hub here in Kerry from Kilorgan. You know, um, I can't be looking out at the beautiful mountains here. we got to go and build partnerships. And it's not just building partnerships in Kerry. we got to build them in Ireland. we got to build them in Europe. got to build them in the US. And that's what we've been doing. Like, you know, I can mention some of the strategic partnerships we've done. With, going back to my old employers in Microsoft, in the Adapt Center. We've done a lot of work with Dog Patch Labs here in Dublin, in the OC. We're starting to build European partnerships now. We're, we're in Europe at a European Startup Villages event next week. Um, and it's just, it's really, really helped. So like that theory that we got from that course just opened my mind to the importance of strategic partnerships and realizing you just can't do it on your own and you've got to think differently and think outside the box. Um, I suppose if I look at the whole journey over the, the three years with the postgrad and the masters, um, anybody that knows me believes I'm a big believer in the power of three. I have to have that in everything I, I talk about. And I suppose for me, there was three elements of what I got out of it. Like, so there was obviously the theory, you know, whether it's the theory of the business model canvas and Alex Osterweiler and all the, all the really good stuff that goes with that. And the second element is the apply, you know, just being able to apply it into the startup or applying it into where I am in the RDI hub now or wherever I go next. But then I think the third one that I think people don't recognize enough is the cohort that you're in the class with, like, you know, and I, I was incredibly fortunate. I think uh, the first assignment, I remember sitting in the room and I think Claire was organizing it a little bit because I think she knew the dynamic of my work. But I was with four people and we've stayed friends to this day and we meet up every year and stuff like that. And um, I learned so much from them as well. They were in different industries. 
they gave me a lot of confidence. They opened my mind to think differently about things as well. Uh, and not just even those four, but there's other people I meet at events that were two of the pros graduated at Masters and they had the next in job and kind of keeping us together. I know there was product camp last week and people came together on that as well. So you learn a lot from the cohort as well and, and that's really important as well. So they would be my three key learnings. Has to be three, doesn't it? Mm-hmm. It has to be three, Liam. I learned that from you. Yes. <laughs> Co-learning. <laughs> So Siobhan, uh, in terms of your master's thesis, which you began to describe there, uh, you went in as marketing manager, you're now marketing director responsible for driving half of the 1.3 billion uh, revenue at X. <laughs> 1.4, sorry, it's just grown in a week. <laughs> uh, but just talk to us about that application of learning and perhaps touch on the cohort as well. Yeah, sure. Um, so as I said, the company was SQS at the time and we've been bought over by a French engineering company. So that was when Explio was born. So now Explio is an end-to-end transformation partner. So we're a consultancy. We specialize in engineering and technology consulting services. Um, we have 17,000 people across the world and 1,000 in Ireland. Um, so at the time when I was going in, I was actually a coordinator at the time, so they realised pretty soon that they'd brought me in like kind of at a too low a level, so they kind of promoted me quite quickly, like after six months, after a year as well. Um, but I had to, as I said earlier, kind of explain to them, like, I actually need a seat at the table, because if we're going to rebrand this organisation, it involves a huge amount of um, organisational change. And, you know, I'm one marketing coordinator, so we're going to need, you know, a big, huge um, wave of ambassadorship and brand ambassadors. We need to build enthusiasm. And a lot of the ideas that I had around the rebrand came from the research that I had done So um, for that dissertation that we mentioned. So I had interviewed people from AIR with the big rebrand, kind of, they had 16 million, I had 90,000 euros. So I had to um, tone down my plans a little bit. Um, but I did as much as I possibly could to bring clients and our people on the journey. Um, because I knew if we got the right start to the rebrand, that we'd be able to build the brand, which takes as you know, absolutely like years and years and years, but we'd be able to build that brand from such a strong foothold. Um, yeah, thank you. Okay. No, so, yeah. One of the things that struck me in thinking about this panel was the creation of future leaders. Um, so both individuals, well actually all three individuals here have been on a quite the career arc, quite the trajectory. So uh, Lucia describing her move from lecturing in the, in the business faculty to now being a pioneer in our sustainability mission. Uh, Liam came in, I think, originally as program manager in Microsoft, now uh, dual CEO, no less, and uh, Siobhan coming in as marketing manager. But I, I, I love the story of, of career switching. And we talked to a lot of people about that, the importance of enabling career switching. And people have that level of expertise already, and what we're trying to do is just layer learning on top of that to enable them to make that shift without, as Siobhan very uh, uh, aptly described, having to take a step back and start over again. And I think uh, Kate mentioned earlier, you know, that additionality, the benefit of additionality in, in skills. And I, I, I love the idea of, of career switching. But, you know, that, that move from, from manager to director, from, from program manager to, to CEO is, is not insignificant. Mm-hmm. So uh, I'm just going to thank the panel very much and we're going to move maybe to take two questions from the room if we may. Thank you. It's great to hear these stories as well. Claire, really I'm picking up on a point that you made about, um, and, and working with TU Dublin uh, and your programme proposals and descriptors and learning objectives. Um, many years ago I was head of the Open Universities Business School here in Ireland. So I was schooled in learning design through the OU. And the simple lesson I learned was really deeply well thought through learning objectives. Then how are you going to know what it is you want them to know and be able to do if it is something they're supposed to be able to do afterwards? And then you bring in the content. That has proven over decades to be very, very difficult as a model for academics, and I know this from working with many universities around the world, because you come with a body of content and you say, this is what I want to to teach. Um, How do you think working with partners in industry uh, in terms of 
understanding assessment comes, or how you're going to assess, comes before you decide how much content needs to be, or what content needs to be applied. How do you think that's changing or happening, if at all? Okay, great question, and I, I might start, and Lucia might back me up, but uh, you're right, it's, it's a significant cha challenge, and there is a tendency to, I think, come with a portfolio and share all of the knowledge we've got in the order that we'd like to deliver it, because we're time constrained, we're busy, we've got to design, deliver, assess, research, engage. And for me, working with partners is key to that. Uh, I don't mind saying I've, in my time in, in TU Dublin and its predecessor institutions, I've worked with very exacting partners uh, who expect, uh, if not week on week, updates on how things are going with programs than month on month, and often in front of industry panels who helped to design the ask in the first instance, but also now I want to know about not just the outputs, so how many you know, graduates are we expecting, but the outcomes. So what is that career progression? What does that look like? And how are you actually measuring that? So other than saying you know, that, that it's, it's, it's self-evident that it's really hard to do, and I devoted many, many hours to, to getting that right, piloting those assessments, pivoting them, iterating them, doing all of those things. And actually, one of the challenges, and I might as well just be very open about it, is that you know, we don't, that's often done in, in spare time because, because there isn't enough time in the week to get that done. So I think it's, it's really important in this era, I talked about that tsunami of change earlier, of such a, a, a clock speed of change. And, and Kate you know, illustrated that so beautifully with, with her you know, numbers there, is that we're gonna have to really think critically and differently about how we design those assessments and how we stand over them in terms of their validity. Um, Lucia, or any, any other questions or any observations? Oh, we've got, we've got two questions, so we might take those from the room if that's okay. For Citibank, my expertise is in user experience design and design thinking. Um, so, Liam, I was particularly interested that as part of your success story, you mentioned that on the course you identified that there wasn't a big enough um, niche in the market for your product, and part of that wisely deciding not to go forward with it was a big piece of this authentic assessment, mm -hmm. that value of deciding not to go forward with an idea, like failing correctly and being encouraged to do that. Um, and I think translating that into real life, into the actual business world is much higher stakes for people. And I think that the authentic assessment provides great opportunity for people to practice that. Um, and I know in Citibank, that was a huge piece of feedback on our employee survey is people want to feel more comfortable that they can put an idea forward and then correctly decide, actually, no, we shouldn't do that. That's not going to work. How do you kind of bring that culture forward in your role as dual CEO where you work now? Yeah, no, I, I, and I, I have a viewpoint on this that, that mightn't agree with everyone, but I think as, as, an, as a country, we've moved a long ways in the last 30, 20, 30 years when I look at it because... Like when I started Microsoft, and I don't mind saying it, back in 1990, you know, we were, I was, we were scared to fail. Like, you know, we'd go to America and the attitude was, God, if we fail, you know, will they pull Microsoft back from Ireland to America? So you just didn't have that confidence. And over time, you know, you built the confidence. And then, you know, the Americans in particular always have the view of fail early, fail often. And, you know, they'd often say it's nearly a badge of honor to fail, you know, whereas we'd feel... Failure is a terrible thing, you know, and I, I think we've, we've grown up a lot as a country around that and things like that. And, and I, that's the, you know, we do a lot of work in the RDI hub uh, with startups. We're involved in the NDLC program with, with Dogpatch Labs and Podashed and Republic of Work. And we're continually encouraging people to do that customer discovery. You know, it's on our pre-accelerator program that we run for eight weeks. It, we actually, every week we expect the, the companies that are on it to go out, if they're a B2C customer, they've got to do eight interviews. If it's B2C, they've got to do 16. And bring that knowledge back and really figure out if that's the customer segment you're going after. Um, but be prepared to move and, and, to, and to accept the learnings that are there and stuff like that. And, you know, 
we always kind of say like feedback is a, is a gift, you know, and if customers giving you feedback that you're in the wrong segment or whatever, take that on board. But, you know, the design pr thinking principles, I'm a big believer in what you say there and in terms of that kind of divergent and ex thinking and, and thinking differently. And, you know, we're even running a course next week with a guy on, on, on creative, creative problem solving for teams and stuff like that. So, but I, my own personal view is, I think as a country, our culture has changed that we're more accepting that we're not always going to get it right and it is okay to fail. Whereas 30 years ago, failure in Ireland was a terrible thing. You know, it was just like you were the worst in the world if you failed. Um, Maura O'Toole from Hi, Maura. BDO. I actually wanted to, to take the question back to the reward system within the third level sector itself. Um, and I wanted to ask about reward for teaching excellence. Because, yeah. I knew that it land well. So my my experience um, within the third level sector would lead me to believe that what is rewarded is research. What is not rewarded is teaching excellence. Is that how long have you got, Maura? Yeah, <laughs> not long, but I'm getting applause for it. So maybe we could try. No, well, I mean, I suppose the good news is, as as a university, we have a new uh, workload model in the workings, which I think may finally give a nod to uh, teaching excellence and engagement. I mean, we do celebrate it, it must be said, but in terms of one's career progression, uh, then there's a faster escalator running for those who research than perhaps those who engage. And I must say, we have three missions, <clears throat> teaching, research, and engagement. I have met one or two geniuses in my academic career that can do all three well. I have some on my team. I'd, I'd like to salute them. But it's really difficult. And I, I think it is one of the things that we really do need to take a good, long, hard look at ourselves. As I say, we're doing that structurally and, and systematically at the moment. And I understand it'll, it'll come out as a model for us in October. Uh, but keep asking the question, Maura. Okay, so um, that just remains for me. I'm, I'm conscious that we, we might uh, take five minutes extra on the, uh, the next panel. Um, uh, we'll steal five minutes from the one hour uh, lunch break, but I do want to keep things rolling on time so that uh, we meet your expectations. And it just remains for me to thank sincerely my colleague, uh, Dr. Lucia Walsh, uh, Liam Cronin, and Siobhan Smith, thank you so much for your time. Thank you. And that concludes our episode today, looking at authentic assessment or applied assessment in executive education. I loved hearing both Siobhan and Liam describe how they applied their university learning to direct their future careers. Their stories echo Claire McBride's assertion, assessment drives learning, and particularly how authentic assessment focusing on real world tasks will empower learners to succeed in the workplace. I will borrow Liam's power of three to summarize my own three key takeaways from this episode. One, the importance of theory, the need for theoretical academic rigor in education. Two, the application of theory into practice, how theory really only becomes relevant or comes to life for the learner through practical application. And three, valuing the cohort of learners you join. I really like this inclusion as we can learn as much from our peers in higher education as we can from our academic facilitators. The university lecture room is really a co-learning space for all. So thank you, Liam, for this concise summary. I hope this episode was useful. And if you would like to chat with any of the team at the Enterprise Academy about future collaborations, please do get in touch. You will find our contact details in the podcast show notes. Until next time, thank you for tuning in. <laughs>